Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 17. In this part, I'm going to teach you about the rotation of the Earth and the rotation of the Earth relative to the Sun. Intuitively, we know that the length of a day is 24 hours because of Earth's rotation relative to the Sun. However, the, the rotation rate relative to the Sun is not constant. There are several factors that come into play. The information in this part is not that important if your focus is satellites orbiting the Earth. Much of what I'll teach you here, however, is counterintuitive. I want you to understand how the Earth's orbit around the Sun affects the length of a day, something we take for granted. I'm also going to show you an application of the formula for true anomaly that I taught you in part 12. I use it extensively um, in this part. I did a lot of research for this part and didn't find good references on the equation of time. I'm going to teach you that and show you how to do calculations for the equation of time for the year 2020 using Excel. I'm going to teach you about the difference between what we call apparent time and mean time. We say that a day is 24 hours long. If you average the actual time it takes the Earth to rotate from noon to noon each day, it averages out to 24 hours. But day to day, the actual time from the sun being directly overhead from one day to the next is a little more or a little less than 24 hours. When I say noon to noon, I mean solar noon to solar noon. It's the time when the sun is directly overhead. Intuitively, you might think that noon local time coincides with when the sun is directly overhead, but it doesn't, and I'll show you why. Intuitively, you might think that, the sun, that sundials keep perfect time. I used to. Sundials don't. We call the actual time when the sun is overhead apparent noon, and that's based on apparent solar time. The 24-hour clock we use to tell time is based on mean solar time. The sun's actual or apparent position at noon mean solar time each day varies. If you were to take a picture of the sun at noon each day for an entire year, here's what you would see. This is called an analemma. The up and down motion makes sense given the 23.44 degree obliquity of Earth's orbit. That's why the sun appears high and low in this picture. The Earth relative to the sun is at maximum obliquity at the solstices. That's the top and bottom of this figure eight. Notice that there's also a side to side motion and that the figure eight is not symmetrical. The equation of time is the formula that gives you the offset between apparent solar time and mean solar time. It's a correction factor that would make a sundial more accurate. It essentially measures the distance in time from a point on this analemma or figure eight to the noon meridian line. There are sundials that are more accurate. The sundial on the left was made in 1812 by Whitehurst and Son with a circular scale showing the equation of time correction. It's on display in the Derby Museum in England. The equation of time is the sum of two effects. The first effect is due to the eccentricity of Earth's orbit around the sun. You recall Kepler's second law from part nine. It characterizes the timing of an orbit along an ellipse. The, Earth's moves, the Earth moves faster at perihelion and slower at aphelion. That affects when apparent noon occurs each day. The plot on the lower left is that discrepancy. The second effect is caused by the obliquity of the Earth's axis of rotation. The Earth is tilted 23.44 degrees relative to the plane of its orbit, which is called the plane of the ecliptic. This also impacts the timing of when local noon occurs. If you combine these two effects, you get the blue curve above. The two effects operate independently. They sum up to a net discrepancy between apparent noon and mean noon. The blue line is the correction you need to tell time accurately on a sundial. These plots are not static. The plot on the lower left is a function of Earth perihelion and aphelion. Over time, there's a slight shift in perihelion and aphelion. The plot on the right is a function of the seasons. And there's a precession of the equinoxes. That shifts the plot on the right. The dynamics that cause these shifts are independent, which means these two curves shift independently of each other. I talked about both these effects in part four. The effect on the left is the precession of the equinoxes. It has a period of 25,771.4 years. The effect on the right is called apsidal precession. It has a period of about 134,000 years. More precise equations of time take these shifts into account. 
If I plot these two effects as a function of time and declination, I get this graph. This maps out the position of the sun in the sky at local noon over the year. This is the analemma, the figure eight pattern I showed you a couple slides ago. You'll recall from part five, I taught you about the celestial sphere. Coordinates on the celestial sphere are right ascension and declination. Right ascension in astronomical terms is in terms of time. Declination is in terms of degrees. The coordinate for the graph on the left, the analemma, are time and degrees, just like the celestial sphere coordinates. So I've essentially plotted this apparent solar motion projected on the celestial sphere. In the graph on the left, there are times when the sun is behind local noon and times when it is, a, it is ahead. That's depicted in the x-axis. There are times when it's high in the sky and times when it's low, and that's depicted in the y-axis. Note the asymmetry in the figure eight. The intersection point is not in line with zero minutes of right ascension, which I call, or I refer to as the meridian. It's also not aligned with the zero degree latitude point, which is Earth's equator. I wanna start by explaining this discrepancy, which is the one due to the eccentricity in Earth's orbit. The Earth orbits the sun once a year. In fact, that's how we define a year. In this animation, the Earth isn't rotating. Notice, however, that relative to the sun, the Earth rotates once. There are about 365 Earth rotations per year. One of them is because of this orbital motion. The other 364 are due to Earth's rotation. At the same time, Earth orbits, it rotates. We define a day to be one Earth rotation relative to the sun. In one year, the Earth rotates relative to the sun 365.246813 times. That's the same as saying there are 365.246813 days in the year. The Earth's rotation and the Earth's orbit around the sun are not synchronized. We keep track of a day with a 24-hour clock. Many of us keep track of a year with a 365-day Gregorian calendar. On that calendar, every four years is a leap year where an extra day, 29 February, is added. That accounts for an extra quarter day each year. You'll notice that the number of rotations is not 365 and a quarter exactly. There is 0 0.00387 of a day too much. In the Gregorian calendar, every year that's divisible by four is a leap year, except for years that are divisible by 100. That accounts for some of the extra 0 0.00387 but it goes a little too far. So centurial years that are divisible by 400 are leap years again. It would have been nice if the Earth orbit were circular, each day would be identical, noon would always be when the sun is directly ahead. It would have also been nice if there were exactly 360 days in the year. The Earth would orbit one degree per day. Of course, the Earth's orbit, if the Earth's orbit were that simple, it probably would have set the discovery of orbital dynamics back centuries. It was the discrepancy in the orbit of the Earth and especially in the orbit of Mars that led to fundamental discoveries of orbital dynamics. Here's what a notional solar day looks like if the Earth were orbiting in a circular orbit. The green line segment starts at noon and ends at noon. Likewise, the red line segment starts at midnight and ends at midnight. If the Earth orbited in uniform circular motion, there would be 365.246813 of these rotations per year. If the Earth orbited in uniform circular motion, the orbit would advance 0 0.01720 radians per day. That's the mean anomaly for one day or 24 hours. I derived that by taking two pi and divided by the, dividing by the period 365.246813 days. Most of the rotation from noon to noon is because of Earth rotation. In uniform circular motion, another 0 0.01720 radians is due to Earth's orbital motion. One solar rotation is thus two pi radians plus the additional 0 0.01720 radians. The Earth in uniform circular motion over rotates by 0 0.01720 radians each day in order for the sun to be overhead each day. Here's a single rotation over what we call a sidereal day. The Earth here goes through one two pi radian complete rotation. From the sun's perspective, however, the Earth under rotates. There are two motions going on here. 
the Earth's rotation and the Earth's orbital motion. Both are in the counterclockwise direction. In one 2 pi radian or 360 degree rotation, the green line segment that started at noon is no longer pointing at the sun, which is what we intuitively equate as noon. The 24 hour period that we refer to as a day is more accurately called the mean solar day. A 2 pi rotation takes less time. 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.0905 seconds. We call that a sidereal day. Here I'm showing both a sidereal day and a mean solar day. You won't see the difference until the animation finishes. Notice that because a solar day is longer than a sidereal day, the Earth both rotates more and travels along its orbit more. Here's an exaggeration. Planet 1 is the starting point, one sidereal day is at planet 2, and one solar day is at planet 3. The effect is much clearer in this animation. If you look closely, when the Earth goes from a sidereal day to a solar day, it keeps orbiting a bit longer. This animation is a bit clearer because I can back it up and move it forward again. You can see the Earth inching along in its orbit between a sidereal and a solar day. Here's the sidereal day from an Earth perspective. Notice that the zero degrees latitude and zero degrees longitude point is aligned with a vernal equinox. I did that arbitrarily. At the end of a sidereal day, the zero degree latitude and zero degree longitude point is realigned with the vernal equinox. This Earth rotation is generally constant. This is rotation relative to the fixed stars. I said generally constant because nothing moves at a constant rate in the universe. The moon is actually slowing down the Earth's rotation because of tidal effects. But for the time scales we're looking at, the difference in rotation is negligible. This is a solar day. And you'll notice at the end, the Earth over rotates a little bit. So let's go back to uniform circular motion. The green line starts with the sun overhead and ends with the sun overhead. So why isn't the sun overhead at mean noon every day? It's because of the elliptical shape of the Earth's orbit. Here's a very exaggerated Earth orbit around the sun. The actual eccentricity is slight, only 0.0167001, but it's enough to cause a variation between a mean solar day and an apparent solar day. I'm exaggerating the eccentricity of the Earth orbit in this diagram so you can see it more clearly. The actual eccentricity would look on this scale like a circle. The sun is at one focus of the ellipse. Here's the perihelion. In 2020, it occurred on 5 January. I include the year because the perihelion date changes year to year. Here is the distance. Here's the aphelion point. In 2020, it occurred on 4 July at 7.48 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And all the times here are Greenwich Mean Time. Here is the distance. The first effect is caused by the changing velocity of the Earth along this ellipse. This effect is cyclical, starting from perihelion. Now I'll add the seasons. Here's the vernal equinox. It's about 75 days after perihelion. This is the time of year when the day and night are 12 hours long everywhere. Here's the summer solstice. This is when days are longest in the north and shortest in the south. Here's the time between them. Here's the autumnal equinox. This is also a time of year when day and night are 12 hours long everywhere. Here's the time between them. And here's the winter solstice. This is the time of year when the days are short in the north and long in the south. And here's the time between them. And here's the time between winter solstice and vernal equinox. That second vernal equinox would be vernal equinox 2021. You'll recall from part four that the seasons don't line up with um, perihelion and aphelion on the ellipse. The first effect of the equation of time starts at perihelion and is caused by varying orbital, orbital motion. The second effect in the equation of time starts at the vernal equinox and is caused by the 23.44 degree tilt or obliquity of the Earth's spin axis. 
The length of the seasons are different because the Earth is not traveling along its orbit at a constant speed. That's because of Kepler's second law. So periodicity of the second effect varies depending on where it occurs in the orbit. This animation demonstrates the orbital motion, how the orbital motion and the Earth rotation interact. I'll start at noon on the Earth with the sun overhead, the green vectors pointing at the sun. After one rotation and a one-day progression along the ellipse, the sun is overhead again. This only happens in two places on the ellipse. In other parts of the orbit, the Earth either under-rotates or over-rotates. By the way, this is a hypothetical day when the sun is overhead from noon to noon. In practicality, it really doesn't occur that way. Recall that an orbiting body at periapsis, or perihelion, for the Earth travels fastest. Here, orbital and rotational motions at perihelion, here are the orbital and rotational motions at perihelion with a very exaggerated eccentricity. Because the orbital motion is faster, the green noon line undershoots and hence does not line up with the sun the next day. The Earth will have to rotate some more, and in order to do that, it will have to travel further in its orbit. At aphelion, Earth travels slowest. Here again, I'm showing both the orbital and rotational motions. Now the green noon line overshoots. Here's what the variation looks like due to the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. This graph is a cumulative effect. The time difference grows to almost eight minutes, plus or minus. The zero points are perihelion on 5 January and aphelion on 4 July. Now I want to explain the discrepancy due to the obliquity of Earth's axis of rotation. This animation shows the 23.44 degree obliquity of Earth's rotation relative to the sun. The Earth is tilted 23.44 degrees relative to the plane defined by the Earth's orbit, which is called the plane of the ecliptic. In this animation, look at the upper right window. You can see that the sun rises above the equator and below as the Earth travels in its orbit around the sun. Here's the perspective from the Earth. The white circle forms the plane of the ecliptic. The green circle forms the Earth's equatorial plane. And the angle between them is 23.44 degrees. Here you can see the sun going high and low relative to the Earth's equatorial plane. The equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic intersect at the equinoxes. This animation shows this clear. The observer is on the equator. The start day is the vernal equinox, 20 March. The local time is noon, and I'm advancing this animation once per day, which means the sun isn't going to rise or set. Right now, on 20 March, the sun's directly overhead. On the equator, the declination of the sun increases and decreases. And you can see the sun doesn't stay on the meridian line precisely. So here's a simplified analemma. It's the red figure eight. The relative motion of the sun is both up and down as well as side to side. The relative daily motion of the sun over a year is the same at any latitude. The only difference is where the sun shows up on the sky. It's lower at higher or lower latitudes. In this video, the sun is lined up on the equator um, and the meridian line. If there were no tilt of the Earth's orbit, the only effect on solar timing would be the eccentricity of the orbit. Notice that when the declination increases, the sun is initially on the meridian line, but over the course of a year, the meridian is at an angle. This angle is what causes the apparent noontime sun to be either ahead or behind mean noontime on your local clock. This part of the video shows you the figure eight pattern. 
In this figure, the figure eight crossing point is at the Earth's equator. That would only happen with a circular orbit. If you combine both effects, eccentricity and obliquity, the center of the figure eight is above the Earth equator, which is what you're seeing here. Here's what the variation looks like. The zero points are the equinoxes and the solstices. This is the vernal equinox on 20 March. This is the summer solstice on 20 June. This is the autumnal equinox on 22 September. And this is the winter solstice on 21 December. What this means is that the analemma crosses the meridian line four times, once at the top, once at the bottom, and twice in the middle. In this animation, it looks like the analemma crosses the meridian where the figure eight crosses. This is the analemma plotted. The crossing point of the figure eight does not align with the meridian. It's offset a bit. Nonetheless, there are four points where this figure eight crosses the meridian. That's why this curve crosses the x-axis four times. If I add these two effects together, I get the blue curve, the equation of time. Note that the gray and orange curves are not strictly sinusoidal. They can, be they can be approximated by a sine or cosine function, but strictly speaking, they're not sinusoidal. This diagram comes from the Equation of Time article in Wikipedia. It shows the geometry for both effects. I want to take you through that geometry now and derive some algebra to compute the magnitude of these effects over a year. I'll start with the effects due to the eccentricity in the Earth's orbit. I talked to the formula for true anomaly in part 12. In the first part of the, the first part of the equation of time is simply the, the difference between the true anomaly and the mean anomaly throughout the Earth's orbit. Here's the true anomaly model I set up in geometry sketchpad that I showed you in part 12. I've lowered the eccentricity to 0 0.2. That's still much higher than the Earth. For this animation, I want you to show you, I want to show you the difference in slide. It's even slighter in actuality than what you see here. As I move the Earth in its orbit, you can see that the mean anomaly either lags or it is ahead. If the Earth were in uniform circular motion, the mean anomaly would equal the true anomaly. The difference between mean noon and apparent noon can be derived from the difference between these two angles, mean anomaly and true anomaly. Here I'm computing the difference. I'll use this delta angle to compute the difference. So if the eccentricity were right, this would give me the adjustment in the equation of time due to the ellipticity of the Earth's orbit. OK, I'm going to go through the algebra, algebra step by step. You saw a lot of this in part 12. The true anomaly is theta at some time t. Here, the time interval is one day, not a sidereal day, but a solar day, 24 hours. And for these calculations, I want to use seconds. So one day is 86,400 seconds. The period of the orbit is capital T and is one year. That equates to 365.246813 days, or 31,557,324.64 seconds. The mean anomaly is 2 pi little t over big T. That's 2 pi over 365.246813 solar days which equates to 0 0.1720 radians of angular orbital motion per solar day. Remember, this is the mean anomaly, which is what the angle would be for one solar day along a circular orbit. Here's Kepler's equation. M equals E, the eccentric anomaly minus epsilon, the eccentricity times sine E. Earth's eccentricity is 0 0.067001 in 2020. And I showed you in part 15, a yearly adjustment for eccentricity. I apply that factor to come up with this. If I plug in the mean anomaly and eccentricity into Kepler's equation, I get 0 0.01720 radians equals E minus 0 0.0167001 times the sine of E. For that value of M, I get that E equals 0 0.01749 radians. And I use Newton's method to derive this. 
and I'll show you how I do this in Excel um, later in this part. Once I have E, I can compute theta, the true anomaly with this equation. Here I'm plugging in values for epsilon and E, and that equals 0 0.01779 radians. Here's the true anomaly theta and the mean anomaly. This is the first day after perihelion. It's when the Earth travels at its fastest. Hence, the mean anomaly is greater than the true anomaly. The difference is minus 0 0.000059 radians. On the previous slide, I showed you that for the first day, the delta radians were 0 0.00059. And I expressed it as a negative number. What does that equate to in time? The Earth rotation rate is 2 pi divided by a sidereal day. That equals 2 pi divided by 23.93447 hours, or 0 0.263 radians per hour. That equates to 15.0411 degrees per hour. And that equates to 7.292 times 10 to the minus fifth radians per second. To get delta minutes, I'll divide the delta radians by Earth rotation rate per second. And that equates to minus 8.05 seconds. On its own, the Earth did 24 hours of rotation. That's 360.986 degrees of rotation on its own. In radians, that's 6.3004. Radians, that's Remember that 2 pi equals 6.2832, which is one full revolution. So 6.3004 is more than one revolution. The orbital motion of the Earth added 0 0.00059 radians of revolution. That means it went past the noon point by 8.05 seconds. I express that as a negative number, so it's consistent with right ascension. Another way to think of that is that the Earth would have to rotate 8.05 seconds less, or 0 0.000059 radians less, in order for the sun to be overhead. Here are the true anomalies for each day of the year. And this is the amount of true anomaly the Earth rotates through in 24 hours for each day of the year. The red line is the mean anomaly at 0 0.01720 radians. From 5 January to 5 April, the true anomaly is greater than the mean anomaly for a day. From 5 April to 5 October, it's less for a day. And then from 5 October to 5 January, it's more again. Aphelion is here, and perihelion is here and here. If I take the difference of the true anomaly and the mean anomaly over a year and then divide by the Earth rotation rate, I get this curve. The Earth is 8.05 seconds ahead of perihelion and 7.7 .7 seconds behind at aphelion. This is the daily difference. In the equation of time, I'm going to compute the cumulative difference. That means that 8.046 seconds for 5 January at perihelion is added to the 8. 0.43 seconds for 6 January, which is then added to the 8.038 seconds for 7 January, etc. The cumulative effect looks like this. The 8 second lag at perihelion gets less and less until about halfway to aphelion, but the negative numbers keep adding up. The delta are negative and increase each day. When they go to zero, that's where the cumulative time function crosses an inflection point. Think of the small plot as the derivative and the large one as the base function. The other effect in the equation of time is due to the obliquity of the Earth relative to the plane of the ecliptic. And here's what that looks like geometrically. In this geometric construction, the Earth is at the center of the coordinate system. And here is the Sun. It doesn't matter whether you put the Earth or the Sun at the center, the math works out the same either way. Remember that the Earth is rotating, hence this would be the position of the Sun at local and apparent noon when the Sun is actually overhead. This angle here, epsilon, is the 23.44 degree obliquity of the Earth. This arc, which is along the plane of the ecliptic, defines the angle from the vernal equinox and the position of the sun. And it's referred to as lambda. This is the right ascension of the sun, and it's referred to as alpha. If the Earth had no obliquity, this would be the angle of the vernal equinox. 
The difference between these two angles defines the change in apparent noon versus mean noon because of this obliquity effect. We know epsilon, the obliquity of the Earth axis, and we can compute the angle from the vernal equinox, lambda, with Kepler's equation. It's simply the true anomaly since the vernal equinox. Determining the right ascension, alpha in this diagram takes some spherical trigonometry. This diagram shows a right triangle projected on a sphere. Here is a list of trigonometric identities for spherical trigonometry. I'm going to make use of this one. The angle alpha is the arctangent of the cosine of epsilon times the tangent of lambda. There's one more factor that I need to add, k times pi, because the results we get back from these trig functions. Orbits go over 2 pi radians. Trig functions return values between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. This k factor will correct that, so alpha will range from 0 to 2 pi. If lambda is in the first quadrant, meaning if it's less than pi over 2, then k is 0. Hence, there's no need for this adjustment factor. If lambda is between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, then k equals 1. And I'll add pi to the arctangent function. If lambda is between 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi, then k equals 2. Hence, I'm adding 2 pi to the arctangent function. The difference in angle is simply lambda minus alpha. This is the offset caused by the Earth's obliquity. And remember, it's zero at the equinoxes and the solstices. Now I want to show you how to do these computations in Excel. First, I need some data in Excel. And there's a wonderful website, astropixels.com, that had all the data I need. It was a little tricky to import the data into Excel. I had to massage the data somewhat. But all the data I use in this Excel example I'm about to show you comes from this website. All right, so here's the Excel spreadsheet that I worked up. And I've posted this in the notes on the YouTube video. So you can see I plotted the curves for equation of time and the analemma. And in order to do that, I came up with some parameters. And I colored these to distinguish the different parameters. Yellow means that the parameter is an input parameter. So for the gravitational constant and the solar mass, those are inputs. Likewise, obliquity, the year, the time zone. Light blue are com computed parameters, and this baby blue color are lookup parameters. The orange are parameters I compute with custom functions that I built in Excel. And then I named all the cell references. And I find the formula is much more intuitive with named cell references. So G is named, solar mass is named, and you can see that solar gravitational parameter is G times solar mass. And that's what the formula looks like in Excel. OK, so those are inputs. That's derived. This is an input, 23.4393. And that's uh, the obliquity in radians. And we do everything in radians. This is the year. And it's actually a pull-down menu. And if I adjust the year, then the equation of time shifts because the timing is different for aphelion, perihelion, and equinoxes and solstices. Likewise, if you want to compute the equation of time for a different time of day, um, the curve shift. And notice that the plots don't work at certain times of day. There's some issues with boundary functions that I didn't fix in this spreadsheet, um, but the tables are correct. So in this cell, if you go to data validation, I can validate this based on a list. And the list is in this table here. And so what that essentially means is in this cell, you can pick any of the years that are in the table on the geocentric solar orbit data worksheet. This geocentric solar orbit data came from AstroPixels. Here are the tables for perihelion and aphelion. I have an astronomical unit parameter that I use to convert the distance to perihelion into meters. There's a distance to aphelion that I convert into meters. 
And then here, the semi-major axis is the perihelion plus the aphelion divided by two. And I look up those values in the table, the astropixels table, based on the year. So if you look at this X lookup function, the lookup value is the year, the lookup array is the year column in the perihelion aphelion table. And then the return array is the distance at perihelion in meters in this column. So these aphelion perihelion distances change year by year, and this gives me a pretty accurate estimate of semi-major axis. And these are the distances in meters, and you can see they vary over the years. Next is eccentricity, and this is green means I did some minor computations. This has the adjustment factor from the year 2000. So it's a fairly accurate eccentricity. And then I compute Earth orbital period. This is orange, which means I made a custom function in Excel to compute this. And you can see it's based on the gravitational parameter and the semi-major axis. And then I divide by seconds per day to convert this into seconds. So a solar day is one day or 24 hours or and 24 hours is one day divided by 24, 1440 minutes, which is 24 hours times 60 or 86,400 seconds. And this is simply a set of conversion factors that I can use in other formulas. So this is the orbital period in days. Now my functions return seconds. So this is the orbital period function. It takes semi-major axis as an input, gravitational parameters as an input, and it's simply 2 pi times the square root of the semi-major axis cubed divided by the gravitational parameter, Kepler's third law. And from that, I can derive the orbital period. Now, if you look this up on Wikipedia, you'll get a different answer. This is the orbital period in terms of hours, so I multiply the period by hours per day, by minutes per day, and seconds per day. Now that latter part I could have done with the formula since it returns seconds. All right, and then this is the mean anomaly at perihelion. And mean anomaly is a function of seconds per day and seconds per orbit, and that's Earth's orbit. And again here, I created a custom function in Excel. So the mean anomaly, takes time as an input and period as an input, and that's time since perihelion. And it's 2 pi times the time, 2 pi times the time divided by the period. And that gives you the mean anomaly. The eccentric anomaly is a function of, and that's the eccentric anomaly, the next one's true anomaly. Eccentric anomaly is also a function, and it takes mean anomaly and eccentricity as an input. And here I use Newton's method where I set my initial guess to pi. I set the ratio to one. As long as the ratio is greater than that number, I take this, which is Kepler's equation, minus mean anomaly, which is the, that's Kepler's equation there. If I subtract the mean anomaly, that's the zero form of Kepler's equation. And then I divide by the derivative of the zero form of Kepler's equation to get the ratio. And then I take that ratio and I subtract it from my guess, my eccentric anomaly, and reset it. And then I keep looping until the error goes below that 0 0.0001 figure. And then here's the custom function for true anomaly takes a centric anomaly and an eccentricity as an input, it's two times the arctangent of the square root of one plus eccentricity over one minus eccentricity times the tangent of eccentric anomaly over two. And then if the true anomaly is less than zero, I add it to two pi to get a, a value between zero and two pi. 
Greenwich Mean Time is a lookup table here, where if I pick a Greenwich Mean Time, I get an offset in hours. And you can see if I click on this link, this is where I got that data. This is pretty readily available. And there's the AstroPiscals website. And then here's the starting point. We start at perihelion. And then this is aphelion. That's perihelion again. And that's a lookup function. So again, on this table, I look up the date. And then I get the time of perihelion from this column here. And you can see the time varies every year. And that's, by definition, day zero. That's our start date, which is calendar day five. And then I want to start this at noon on perihelion. So I take the day, I round it to a whole number, and then I add 0 0.5. In Excel, the internal format for date and time is days, is whole numbers, and then time. Um, hours and minutes and seconds as fractions. So if I take the day and hours and add 0 0.5, I get noon. And you can see if I pick a different date, then all these dates shift based on the tables in the geocentric solar orbit data. Likewise, if I shift the hours, they shift as well. So this is a simple function which just computes the day of the year for 4 July. So I round down the time at aphelion minus the year at aphelion, and then I subtract 5, because this all starts at 5 January. So 108, aphelion is 181 days after perihelion. And then this is the time to the vernal equinox, which is when the second effect starts. And this is the mean anomaly at vernal equinox. So that is mean anomaly given the time to vernal equinox and the second to vernal equinox. And then I compute the second, the eccentric anomaly based on that mean anomaly and then the true anomaly based on that mean anomaly. And so that's the quantity lambda that I showed you on the previous diagram, which I'll need for the second set of computations for the equation of time. And then here's the sidereal day, 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.095 seconds. And that's how I compute a sidereal day in seconds. The hours times seconds per hour, minutes times seconds per minute, plus the sidereal seconds. That's a sidereal day in minutes. And that's a sidereal day in hours. Now, I don't need all these parameters. I did some of this for convenience. And then here's the Earth rotation rate. 360 divided by sidereal days in hours, 15.0411 degrees per hour. That's degrees per minute, and that's degrees per second. However, we like to do everything in radians. So there's radians per hour, 2 pi divided by sidereal day hours, 2 pi divided by sidereal day minutes, and 2 pi divided by sidereal day seconds. Okay, now I want to show you how I do the plots. So I put all this data into a table. And Excel has a nice feature where you can define tables. I can give tables names so that they're intuitive. And you define a table this way, just formatting a range of cells as a table. The day of year is simply um, an index from 0 to 365. And the description is based on those days I computed and the names on the left. And this is just for convenience. So there's the vernal equinox. Now, that's the vernal equinox day. 
That time is at 12 noon. The vernal equinox is actually at a different time. There's the summer solstice day, the Aphelion day, the autumnal equinox day, and the winter solstice day. So that's just for convenience. Those aren't really needed in the computations. And you can see those are very specific times. None of them occurs at noon. Then the start day is the first day in the table. And then here I'm computing seconds since perihelion. So because 5 January noon is after perihelion, there's 15,120 seconds from perihelion. That column is the mean anomaly, and there's the function I use to compute that, which I showed you before. 2 times pi times the time divided by the period. So it's seconds since perihelion and seconds per orbit. And then this is the eccentric anomaly for that mean anomaly. It takes mean anomaly eccentricity as its input. And then here's true anomaly. It takes eccentric anomaly and eccentricity as its inputs. And again, I use Newton's method to compute eccentric anomaly based on mean anomaly and eccentricity. So I start with a guess of pi. I set this ratio to 1 just so the do loop can start. And as long as the ratio is above that number, I keep iterating. And again, this is the Kepler's equation. I subtract mean anomaly to get the zero form. There's the derivative. I divide by the derivative and get that ratio. And I keep subtracting that from eccentric anomaly. And eventually, this code converges on a solution. And then this is true anomaly. Based on eccentric anomaly and eccentricity, it's two times the arctangent of the square root of 1 plus eccentricity divided by 1 minus eccentricity times the tangent of the eccentric anomaly divided by 2. And then if that result's less than 0, then I take that result, 2 pi minus that result, to make it between 0 and 2 pi. Now, the mean anomaly, the second anomaly, and true anomaly, they keep increasing until they go from 0 to 2 pi. I want to know the daily difference. So this column is the amount of true anomaly that the Earth goes through each day, each 24-hour period. And I plotted that here. So that's how I did the plot that I showed you on the previous slide. That's this column. And I'm just subtracting one day from the next. The mean anomaly is pretty simple. It's always the same for every 24-hour period, 0 0.01720. And then the delta angle is the difference between mean anomaly and true anomaly. However, if that difference is less than 2 pi, I'm sorry, if it's greater than 2 pi, I want to subtract that value from 2 pi. And it's another boundary condition where I want to make sure this is between 0 and 2 pi, or negative 0 and 2 pi. And then the time delta is simply that delta angle divided by the Earth's rotations per minute in radians. And then that's how I get the daily delta time that range from 8.046 seconds to about 7.7 .7 seconds. And then I just put a column of zeros as a reference. That would be the change in mean anomaly. All right, so here's the time delta that's cumulative. It's the delta angle 
divided by the Earth's rotations per minute in radians. And you can see this. Yeah, it, it's additive. So the the time delta is in minutes, the time delta per day is in seconds. But if you add those, you get this function here. So that function, I simply plotted this column. And this is the first component of the equation of time. And you can see this a little more clearly if I do it this way. So that's a cumulative effect because the rotation gets further and further behind until it doesn't anymore and then it gets more and more ahead. And in the combined plot, that also is the first component of the equation of time due to the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. So the second component, I need to compute the time sensor to the vernal equinox. And it can be ahead or behind. And that's simply the daytime minus the vernal equinox times the number of seconds per day. So that's the number of seconds ahead or behind the vernal equinox in time. And you can see here the vernal equinox, it goes from a negative number to a positive number, which makes intuitive sense. And then based on that, I can compute the obliquity of the sun. It's the 23.4393 obliquity times the sine of that time column I just computed times 2 pi divided by seconds per orbit. And the time and the seconds cancel and you end up with degrees. So this is a measure of the obliquity over the orbit of the Earth. And it varies from about 23.44 to zero to minus 23.44 and back again. Okay, this is the angle to the vernal equinox, which is essentially the true anomaly minus the true anomaly of vernal equinox. And if that is less than zero, then we add two pi to that to make the value between zero and two pi. If it's greater than zero, we just go with that value. So here's two pi plus true anomaly minus true anomaly at vernal equinox. And then there's just the straight value, the difference of true anomaly and true anomaly at vernal equinox. And then here's the right ascension at noon. And this is the equation that uses that K factor I told you about. So if the angle of vernal equinox is less than pi over two, if it's in the first quadrant, we take the arc tangent of the cosine of obliquity times the tangent of the angle of vernal equinox. If the angle of vernal equinox is less than three pi or obviously greater than pi over two, then we add pi to the arctangent function. And here we add two pi. That's if the angle is greater than three pi over two. And this is a little easier to see if I put some carriage returns in here. And that one goes there. So this kind of logic is easier in Excel. With a formula like they describe in Wikipedia, um, it gets a little more convoluted. And then the delta angle is simply the angle of the vertical equinox um, minus the right ascension. And then that is divided by the rotations per minute in radians. And from that, we get this curve from this column here. So I've computed the two components of the equation of time. Here I sum them. 
and that gives me this blue curve. And that is the derivation of the equation of time. And then this is in seconds, if you prefer seconds. I didn't use this for any of the plots. So in AstroPixels, um, they actually have a table where they computed the equation of time. And so this is what AstroPixels data looks like. And here I compare the two. Now, AstroPixels is pretty good data. Mine, there's some assumptions. But you can see in that first graph, it's pretty close. The sun declination is a little bit off. But I didn't use sun declination for any of the computations for equation of time. OK, that's how the Excel spreadsheet works. Okay, so the main takeaways. I want you to understand the difference between a uh, mean solar day and a sidereal day. Um, and I want you to understand conceptually how the equation of time works. Um, also, in that spreadsheet, um, because I had declination, I was able to plot the analemma. I didn't show you that, but there was a column. I did show you the column with declination. And then uh, the time delta and equation of time is the x-axis. And then lastly, um, I wanted to show you how to do these computations with a spreadsheet. Again, the article on Wikipedia was extremely helpful. It was the best reference I could find. But they're trying to come up with a formula where you can plug in um, the date, the time, and other various parameters um, and get a single answer for a given day. I find it much easier to make tables like this in Excel and not worry so much about the boundary conditions. Um, and then do the computations one step at a time. It's more intuitive and it's a bit simpler. Um, and as I said, I will post this Excel spreadsheet um, and put a link to it in comments for the video.